And now, please welcome Colin McLaurin. Good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time it is in your country. So David Livingston was an amazing explorer and missionary in Africa. Really quite an extreme and dynamic character. I love his story, so I hope you appreciate some of it too. You know, he was born in very humble beginnings. He was in a small Scottish town. He was very poor. Life was hard, called Blantyre. Only a thousand people or so, or a few thousand. Anyway, when he was 10 years old, he started working in the cotton factory. So he would have 14 hour days working from 6 a.m. till 8 o'clock at night, only two breaks for meals in that, tying cotton together as the spinner would be spinning the cotton. So it sounds like a terrible job. It was like a kid's job. 14 hour days. And you know, this sort of experience would grow character and a work ethic that would help David later in his life in Africa. You know, he found plenty of time in that for personal growth. He used to love reading and trying to grow his character that way. So even while working, have a book propped up on a shelf. So just as he'd rush past while working, he'd just skim a sentence and slowly read books that whole way. Even when he got home, he'd spend two hours reading Latin and then read other books until midnight or later. So he just had this unbelievable work ethic that I think puts most of us to shame. You know, his favourite topics were science and travel. So we can see that travel really came into its own later in his life. And as for the science, it was part of his real conversion to becoming passionate about God, that he had some of his questions about science answered. His dad had been a bit sceptical that science might undermine faith. And David was once reading a book about astronomy, about the stars. And he had some questions. And his, David said, his father said, well, if you have questions, why don't you just go and ask the author? The father assumed that every Scottish person lived in Glasgow, the capital, which wasn't too far away. It actually turned out this guy was halfway across the country, across the whole country, actually. So David set out on foot, walked 130 kilometres in two days, got there, found the guy, <coughs> asked his questions. This is in the pre-Google Maps days. It wasn't so easy back then. And uh, had his questions answered, walked home again. This is the sort of person that he was, and we'd see this in Africa a lot as well. So anyway, he decides to become a missionary, a medical missionary. So he trained to be a doctor, and he also studied theology. And when he'd finished all that while working incredible hours as well to support himself, he travelled to South Africa, arrived at the port. Back then, there was no buses to catch or anything like that. He bought oxen and bought carts, had to buy food, and made this slow, laborious travel, a thousand kilometres inland, to a mission in what's Botswana today. It was a Robert Moffat, and the uh, mission was called Kuruman. I just want to say hi if there's any, any Motswana speaking Setswana living in Botswana online today. I just want to say Dumelara, Dumelama, and uh, thank you. You know, um, he got there, and Moffat wasn't actually at home. Moffat was in England trying to get a Bible translated and published in the local Setswana language. And people were cautious, of course. This is a foreign country. This is dangerous. And David's like, oh, I want to get into things. You know, I want to go exploring and meet the tribes around the place. People are like, you know, well, well, easy. Like, it's really dangerous. And don't you think we should wait till Moffat gets back? You know, he's kind of the expert. He's the leader. He'll know what to do. Just, just, just relax. Just wait until he comes back. He'll know. Anyway, that's not what David would do. It's not the sort of person he was. So determinedly, he set out with one of the other missionaries and uh, went around that area, traveling north and around, meeting a lot of the local African people. And in a few months, he was actually speaking the language and making all these contacts and friends. Really quite amazing. At one time, he was with warriors from the Baka tribe. I'm going to pronounce many names wrongly today. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, he overheard them mocking him. He's like, look at this skinny white guy. Like, he's not going to manage the distance. Like, he's, he's too weak. He's not going to make it. So once he heard that, he's like, right. So he sets an even faster pace until the warriors were so exhausted there was no time to criticize or anything like that. A very hardy person. You know, another time, he was with the Baklatas tribe, and they had a problem with lions. And he was teaching them what a lot of African tribes did in other places. The warriors would make a circle around the lion and slowly close in, understanding, of course, you know, we would respect animals, but this was a danger to human life, and a lot of people were killed and maimed. They'd make a circle and close around until they speared the lion to death in the end. But with this tribe, the warriors were afraid of the lions, and possibly superstition was part of it as well. And uh, David helped them. He said, I'll back you up. 
anyway, he aims his double barrel rifle into the bush where there was this line that was terrorizing people and unloaded two shots into it. Unfortunately, the lion rushes out of the bush and gets him, um, has deep injuries on his arm, on his shoulder, and almost died, actually. He was very lucky he didn't die. But the other warriors got in with spears and eventually the lion was dead. But uh, David never regained the use of the arm. He broke it again and then he couldn't lift it higher than shoulder height. He had to learn to shoot his rifle with the opposite arm, but he made do and he continued on. There was a lot of pain, but he put up with it. That's who he was. You know, they say he only had one real Christian convert, some people say. His name was Sir Kelly of the... Uh, of the um, Bakwain tribe. And David was so impressed by this guy. He was very intelligent and he was a good leader of his people, a wise leader. Um, the Bible had been translated by now and published into the local language, but using Latin letters. Uh, and Sir Kelly picked up the language, the alphabet, in a day. And eventually he was reading the Bible in his own language. And he became actually a great missionary amongst his own people. So it's really quite an amazing friendship they had. Of course, David was all about persuasion. You know, this is not the con conquistadores in South America or anything like that. Uh, he didn't have power and authority over these people anyway. Um, he was outnumbered and persuasion and making friends with people was really the approach he used to try to share Christianity with people. He did a lot of amazing exploring further north. He crossed the Kalahari wilderness Many of us have seen The Gods Must Be Crazy. about the, It's a fictional movie about the Kalahari Bushmen. He crossed that area. They almost died from not being able to find water to drink. He found a, a famous lake. Uh, he was the first European to find what we now call Victorian Falls. David actually named the falls after Queen Victoria, who he would later meet. He received a gold medal from the Royal Geographic Society in London for all this great traveling and adventuring. And of course, some people were critical. They thought, what has this got to do with missionary work? Like he spends much of his time just traveling around the, the country exploring. And true, it was very different. But David's great aim was that by opening up the country and discovering trade routes and so on, he hoped that by introducing trade and commerce, this would help to take away the slavery problem. He was a, a strong anti-slavery advocate. And this, of course, made him lots of enemies with some of the other foreign countries who were in the area, the, the Boers, the Portuguese, um, the Arabs and others like that as well. Even, you know, some of the Africans were also enslaving other Africans. Uh, yeah. But, you know, he wasn't seeking glory. He was just trying to open up trade routes so that something better than people could be traded in. He was trying to really change and reform. That was his intention. There's one story I'd like to tell you where he managed to cut across the whole width. And if we have the picture on the next slide, you can actually see the map of where he was. Um, he cut across the entire width of Africa, which had never been done at that latitude before. And it was incredibly dangerous. There's lots of hostile tribes speaking different languages and different cultures. And though he had friends, there was, you know, he'd, he'd go to a new area where they were enemies with the people he'd previously made friends with. And he was, he had a great skill in mastering all his diplomacy and trying to win over these, these warrior chieftains and all these people. Really had incredible ability that only a radical pioneer with this sort of rugged determination could actually manage. He contracted river fever as well. That's what they called it back then. Um, and, uh, you know, you might recognise this. We call it by a different name now. But he noticed that mosquitoes were often in the area where people would get sick. It would cause incredible lethargy, uh, headaches. He had ulcers around his mouth, vomiting. Um, we now, of course, know river fever by the name of malaria. malaria. And uh, 30 years later, actually, in Britain, somebody would scientifically prove there's a link between mosquitoes and malaria. So Dave, and this guy actually won the Nobel Prize for it, but Dave was actually ahead of his time in some of this. But given the malaria, he was exhausted, yet he kept pushing on. That's what he was. He was emaciated. He was wasted. He was as pale as a ghost, and yet he managed to push through. One experience was when he was in a tribe in Central Africa, and he's sitting at a meeting. There's a thousand people present, and suddenly these warriors rush towards him. 
They're brandishing swords above their heads. They're shouting and yelling at him. They're armed to the teeth. Most people, of course, who have no idea what to do, you'd run, you'd sit there in fear. But David had seen this before. He knew it was just an act. It was a test. And he just sat there calmly, just watched them as their face are grimaced and they're yelling and, and threatening and running towards him, just sat there, relaxed. And sure enough, they went away. He'd passed the test. He hadn't showed fear and ran. All these sorts of challenges. Other times he had to use more aggression to try and defend his life and the life of people attacking them. But anyway, he ended up making it to the west. You can probably see, you probably can't, on the map there, there's a place called Luanda, which is in Angola today. And this was just an absolute shock to the foreigners who were living in that city that somebody had made it through across the entire width of Africa. It was just absolutely unbelievable. He became very, very famous for all this exploration and travels. So anyway, what are some objections that people have to missionaries, and David Livingston in particular? Well, one of them is called the white saviour complex. It's a criticism now that too often in movies and stories, there's a story where you have a, a people from a developing nation like Africa, and in comes the white person who, you know, is the only person that can help these people because they're too defenceless and, you know, all this. And it's a criticism. There's too many movies which follow this theme. I just want to say I'm definitely not supporting this sort of idea. Uh, I do believe on one hand that Africa really needed people like David Livingston. Yet on the other hand, I really believe that all of us need Africa as well. We all need each other. For those who are Christians, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We need each other. Personally, one of my churches was um, founded in large part by an African-American, and I believe that part of that cultural heritage that he had actually shows a, a side of God. It shows a side of what we see in the Bible, um, a, a spirituality side that I wouldn't have realized from my cultural background, you know, being reserved. I was Scottish too many generations ago. So I really believe that Africa needed David Livingston and we need Africa as well. We all need each other, but really what we all need is Jesus. You know, some people say, well, why don't the missionaries just stay out of it? You know, let other countries mind their own business. This is a common view in the West today. When we look back to the 1800s, which was David's time and criticize, my response to that would be that there was lots of foreigners getting involved in Africa at this time, most of them with their own selfish interests. Uh, there was a Portuguese slave trader that David met called Silva Porto. And David hated to admit it, but he saw many commonalities in personality between this guy and himself. Both were incredibly fearless. Both were incredible pioneers and explorers. And both had been places where none or very few Europeans had actually ever been to before. And yet the slave trader was using all this great work and boldness for bad whereas David was using it for good, using his medical training to heal people. He was, um, he was telling people about Jesus. He was fighting slavery. There was other people with that same bold, rugged personality type who just were neutral and just had direction. They had no direction. There was one guy who just wanted to hunt game. And, uh, you know, he wasn't really so bad or so good, just enjoying himself and living for himself, you know, so... I'd say we need the people who are going to step up and stand up for good in the world and share about Jesus. Just finally, David was imperfect. He had his flaws, as we all do. But, you know, I want to, I want to mention that to be real about it and authentic, but I don't want to dwell on that. I believe that people today think that they're not judgmental, but I, I see a lot of criticism and judgment. I think a fair approach would be real and authentic that David certainly had his flaws he didn't do well as a leader of his own people. Uh, he didn't always get on with people because he's rugged determination and strong opinions and so on. But I believe that these are really the bad sides, what was otherwise a very good part of his personality and was used for good. So overall, um, an amazing servant of Jesus, uh, a rugged, unbelievable pioneer. And my question is to you, what are you focused on? To help you understand God's Word in a whole new way, go to goodnewsunlimited.com. You can sign up there to get your free devotional delivered to you each day. This 
program has been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.